Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today we've got another gun gripe episode for you and I've got a couple of special guests with me here today to co-host. We've got Matt and Clint from Meet the Pressers. They have a great YouTube channel and podcast. I strongly suggest you check them out. Great couple of guys. Uh, Matt here is from upstate New York and Clint is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So getting some fresh perspective in the house, uh, you know, hopefully we can attack this from many different directions. Mm -hmm. And we've got a real doozy of a gun gripe here. We're going to be talking a little bit about selective enforcement when it comes to uh, law enforcement approaching things from many different directions. Uh, and we're going to get in, uh, be getting into not only some 2A stuff, but we're also going to be getting more into, uh, let's just say this like medical cannabis and some of this weird slippery slope involving Title I substances and the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. It would actually be a really good opportunity for me to tell you guys about USCCA, uh, United States Concealed Carry Association. You guys have probably heard of them or heard that uh, term thrown around a little bit. Uh, they are a great group of people. They provide self-defense legal protection. So if you're involved in a legal shooting, uh, they definitely go out of their way to provide the legal resources to make sure uh, that you're taken care of and that you can come out, uh, you know, hopefully on top. They do have lots of firearms education, different training resources, tons of videos, guides, books, and articles. So don't think of it like a... Um, like a gun insurance type of thing. The best way to think about it is along the lines of a total training regimen and a advocacy regimen that helps make sure that you're not put in a situation where you're going to be involved in a bad shooting or you're going to make a bad decision. So they help, you know, give you the resources to make sure that you understand the laws in your area, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do, what's a good shoot, what's a bad shoot. So really, really great opportunity for that. It's more than a firearms insurance. Uh, it provides you with a good amount of knowledge across a broad spectrum of different things to make sure that you are a well-informed and trained gun owner as well. So that if you are involved in a shooting, that it is something that you're going to come out on top legally and make sure that you're not going to get in a bunch of trouble, okay? Uh, they do have three tiers. They have a gold, platinum, and elite. And each of those different tiers uh, provides some different coverage amounts uh, in terms of liability coverage, personal in injury coverage, and stuff like that. So check it out. Use the code IV8888. Uh, check out the link below. Go over to USCCA and tell them that we sent you. And oddly enough, when it comes to USCCA, you actually wrote an article uh, involving the very subject matter, essentially, that we're discussing in this yeah. video. So go down below here and check out the link if you want to read Matt's article uh, regarding, uh, you know, the 2A uh, and medical marijuana paradigm and everything like that. So we are going to dive into this. And I think you'll realize that we're going to get into some areas you might not be expecting on this particular gripe. So buckle yeah. in. And let's get into it. So, guys, thanks for coming back on Gripes. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having us. How's it going? Oh, Very good. Wonderful. So, when we get into the selective enforcement, fellas, well, I guess what we wind up getting into is that what what posed this question or what made us bring this question up was like, why is it that you see where, let's say, a state comes out, and because you know we all respect and and honor states' rights, and mm -hmm. states should be able to determine things in the way that they need to. You look at a state like California or a, a state similar to California yep. that maybe they have legalized, you know, marijuana use or decriminalized marijuana use within their state, right? But then federally, okay, it's still unlawful to use it. Yep. So it gets into this really weird paradigm where, Definitely. okay, if the law enforcement, if federal law enforcement is not going around and busting everybody's chops on the, on the cannabis end of things, but then one tiny little minor uh, federal level gun infraction that they can yeah. throw the book at someone on, they'll send a whole SWAT team of people after them to go do that. So it seems that selective enforcement can come in many different forms. Selective enforcement can mean uh, literally an entire federal agency turning a blind eye to a given issue, mm. or it can mean that they actually weaponize the system specifically against very small and deliberate and direct groups of people. We see that with uh, the January 6th commission. We mm -hmm. see that with many other things. Mm -hmm. We're not going to dive into that, yeah. but it's clear before we get started that we recognize the fact that selective enforcement comes from both ends of the equation when it comes to both the negative and positive. And I guess it just depends on what side of the aisle you might be on as right. to how you 
uh, view that. Yeah, I mean, even looking at like officer discretion, officers have discretion when it comes to traffic stops and such, but they can even be over overtaken or overruled, if you will, by the district attorney. If the district attorney says, nope, I'm gonna prosecute. There's tons of cases out there that we, we can see evidence of that, um, you know, with different cases across the country. Uh, so, I mean, why wouldn't it be the same way if you've got a federal agency that decides that they're going to be hard on drugs or not hard on drugs or hard on 2A supporters and not hard on 2A supporters? It, it kind of makes sense. It's, you know, where those political winds blow, if you will. Well, I think it's, it's fair to say with any type of government agency or any type of elected official or government, government official, politics is going to play. Mm. That's part of it. I mean, we can even look at self-defense cases where perhaps... You know, there was a very pro-gun prosecutor and he decided not to charge when maybe there was some things that that, that gun owner could have done differently in that dynamic critical incident. Or on the other side, maybe that gun owner did everything absolutely right, but that Still. prosecutor is so anti-gun and they're so far down their rabbit hole of ideology yeah. that they're going to do everything they can to trip that person up because they're exercising a right that they see no value in. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a very, very good observation. I think what you wind up seeing, too, is that not only do politics play into it in terms of individuals and their political ideology and the political ideologies of parties, party politics. I think what you also wind up seeing is that po politicians have some very basic functions in life. One is to get elected. Mm -hmm. Two is to get reelected. And three is to solve their problems yeah. and to make money with their office. I mean, one way or the other, political office is power. It is influence. Mm -hmm. It is looking behind the curtain. It is yeah. it is insider trading. It is lobbying. Like so, there are many different fingers that ball up into the fist that is uh, political might, and they Humans wield are it. Yes, men are men. Men mankind is fallible. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we won't get into that. But the thing is, is that when those when those fingers close, they form a fist, and they're willing to swing that fist at whoever they feel gets in the way of their ability to obtain and keep said power. So when you know that that is the reasoning behind why all this is happening, you understand that not only are gun laws bullcrap, but so are some of these like rules when it comes to Schedule One substances, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Schedule One. If you haven't like looked into the the legal, uh, let's just say bearing that it has in terms of its severity. Mm -hmm. Okay, Title One is, is is like the top tier for the danger and legal ramifications and things that a given substance might have, right? And without getting too far in the weeds, uh, when you look at Weeds. The history. See what you did. There. <laughs> <laughs> without getting into the da without getting into the weeds, what we wind up seeing is that many of these substances were put on Title I to unfairly mm. uh, disenfranchise certain aspects of the community. Okay, certain certain individuals in the community, yeah. right? Sure. Uh, namely, minorities, uh, poor communities. Uh, things of that nature. So when you see that these laws were put into place in the first place to keep their thumbs down on very specific aspects of society, yeah. you, you begin to see that not only are the 2A laws a disenfranchisement of good, honest people everywhere, but so are some of these drug laws, right? When you see the original meaning that they were, you know, conceived under, uh, you realize that they are just as unfairly treated on the, the, some of those uh, things, like, you know, basically creating an entire subculture of people that they can weaponize the system against at will. So it's kind of a weird paradigm to see that. And yeah, when you see this stuff like this that happens across the state, a lot of people, as we see drugs become illegal, drugs become legal, such as cannabis in New York State. Um, you know, people are like, oh, I can, I can have my guns and my weed, and I'm like, oh, technically you can't federally because 4473 and, and that aspect of it. But then we wonder, like, well, if they pass it in the state, that means it's legal, and it's not legal federally. Like, well, are they going to enforce it? Well, I don't, I don't know. Are they enforcing um, other things such as illegal? You know, illegal aliens being in 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 town, and as yeah. far as human trafficking, human trafficking. I mean, there's a mi many a things yeah. that they can and will turn a blind eye to when the political winds blow in yeah. their way. Yeah, and you you had mentioned <clears throat> that that it's uh, 
You can say it's it. Not, well, it's not, it's not you know, it, it, the, the political parties, they, they want to stay in power. So they're, they're going to do whatever they can and use whatever they can to their advantage. And when you've got somebody who has marijuana and they have guns or they have cannabis and they have guns and they, do, they see them as a threat, wow, look at this. We've got this. We can go and get this person or take them down. We've seen that in our industry with, you know, other YouTubers, right? right. Um, which it's to their advantage, but to our disadvantage. And they're always looking for something when it's to their benefit. When it's not to their benefit, such as sanctuary cities, right? They look a, took, turn a blind eye, you know, even though it's federally illegal to harbor a fugitive, you got states like New York State doing it all the way, you know, open arms, come on in. But when it comes to guns, it's the flip side of it. Clint, what's your thoughts on 2A sanctuary uh, counties or cities, or, or let's just say, Whatever the size of the of the municipality or, or the the governmental entity might be, whether it's just an individual city or county level, like maybe the sheriff mm -hmm. issues a, a countywide two A sanctuary edict or whatever the case may be, what are your thoughts on the legal weight of well, those of I, those actions? I think that's really dependent upon the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, each state has different laws, and and the sentiment of that is righteous. You know, I think it, the sentiment of that is totally righteous. You know, an elected official saying, I will stand by the Constitution and respect your individual right to liberty or your right to bear arms or, or whatever the case may be. But the thing is, people have to understand every state having its own laws, there's a lot of nuance there. So uh, I'll speak specifically in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been, uh, Firearms Owners Against Crime, we've generally been against the sanctuary movement because we have state preemption laws. And many times local municipalities would pass laws that violated the Second Amendment. We would take them to court and win because the preemption laws in Pennsylvania say that no municipality can pass a law that supersedes state law when it comes to guns, ammunition, so on and so forth. So if we as an organization came out in favor of sanctuary ordinances saying that, yes, you know, uh, this city should pass this and, and make it a thing, then we would very likely lose standing in our court cases moving forward. Mm. So the, the thought behind them and what it means, I think, is very righteous. Yep. But on the other hand, it has no teeth, and it in some ways violates the laws in yeah, Pennsylvania. It may not have teeth, but it does maintain solidarity and give you an idea of, of their record and what they support. So yeah, at least, at least they're true. going on record and saying, hey, I will draw this line in the sand and my citizens aren't going to be subject to this, mm. even though, even if it may not have the legal weight that it needs to grow the teeth it needs, at least there is a statement that is made that they can, they can, they can put on record and here, here's, I went on record in support of the Second Amendment. Yeah. At least they're going on record and they're willing to put themselves out yeah. there. Well, I, I appreciate that and there's value in that, but let's look a year ago. Where were those sanctuary ordinances when, like, the governor of Pennsylvania shut the yeah. FFLs down? Yeah. You know, there, there was nothing that happened with that. The, you know, the local county commissioner didn't say, open up the FFLs. So, right. I mean, that's something that's that we have to understand. When it, they said, hey, we're going to do this, but then they didn't. They, but yeah. then they didn't, right? So yeah. uh, it, these things only work if the people actually get behind it. Yeah. And it's one thing at a rally to shake your hand and do all that, and that's yeah. great. Call you know, a lot of people came out for some of the... You know the sanctuary ordinance rallies and things that took place in pennsylvania but when the rubber meets the road and we all have to stand shoulder to shoulder and stand up and say no mm -hmm. there is a line in the sand here it seems we can't quite get the numbers to come out at that point in time and that's that's unfortunate so making phone calls sending emails doing all that stuff standing up next to your fellow citizen to say no this isn't going to happen uh we're a little lacking in the numbers when that when that comes i agree and if it's one thing that we can say about the political opponents to the Second Amendment is that they are quite good at organizing yeah. and they're very vocal and they're very active. And we're going to switch gears for a second and I'm going to just pose sort of a philosophical question, if, if we yeah. will. So at what point is someone's life forfeit simply because they use a certain substance, right? Okay, so if someone's drunk in a bar, for instance, do they not mm -hmm. have the right to defend themselves? If someone is under the influence of cannabis, do they not have the right to defend themselves? So it becomes a slippery slope when you look at the, the, the minutia of it uh, because there are places where a group of people is willing to say, okay, if you use this illicit substance that whatever is on Title I substance federally, uh, we're not going to prosecute you or give you a hard time about it or whatever, right? 
But a lot of those places that generally say, hey, we're cool with, with cannabis, generally are very, very anti-gun. Mm -hmm. And there are some areas uh, across the United States where folks are, you know, they're very pro-gun and uh, pro-cannabis. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's strange to me that the, the paradigm of freedom and the paradigm of liberty and that they're, they're okay with one freedom but not the other. Like, I, I find an issue with that, yeah. uh, with selecting freedom and saying, well... I'm all right with this, but not with this. It's mm. like, you, you can't go halfway. If you're going to say, well, screw this federal law and we're not going to deal with this here, aren't you kind of really beholden to, to oppose all federal laws that are unconstitutional as at their whole? That would be ideal. And wouldn't that be ideal? Mm. I mean, yeah. so the question remains, like, do you lose your ability to defend your home and your life or protect yourself in public with a firearm if you are under the influence of any substance. Hmm. Uh, caffeine is a substance. Sure. Oxygen is a drug. That's a substance. Yeah. We're under the influence of many things every day. <laughs> our personal values, yeah. our principles. Uh, our, we our breathe emotions. oxygen. Mm -hmm. I mean, nicotine's a drug. Caffeine's a drug. Yeah. I mean, so there's all these things that one could just say is, that's a drug. And who determines so, it? So, yeah, well, who, who gets government. to determine what is good for one person may not be good for another. It's just, it just seems a little biased well, and unfair. Individual True. rights and liberties aren't forfeit just because someone made a poor choice or have a bad judgment. Uh, you know, if, right. if I'm drunk, say for instance, I still have my fifth amendment, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I don't think, I, I think if it's going to be that way, we, we have all of these rights available to us. But, now, but if you're drunk, should someone be able to just kill you because they don't like you? Or does your right to preserve your life, is it forfeit? You, every, every American has the right to preserve their life and right. should be able to exercise those rights. So, un, so yeah. if someone's drunk in a bar and they're carrying a pistol, should they be able to protect themselves? Yeah, and Would they some, be able to? in some states they can. <laughs> Would they be able you know? to? Now, they're still, they're still beholden to, you know, every, you know, like, look, if it was some emergency and some terrible situation and you just happen to be having some beers and dinner with the buds at, yeah. at a local restaurant and carrying your firearm, you have to outweigh... The connotation yeah. between, all right, well, I may not supposed to, I may not be allowed to have my gun, but you know what? I've got it, and here's this terribly heinous thing about to happen. So, at what point does a series of diminishing returns start to come into place, and you have to say, well, yeah, I'm breaking the law, but I'm about to do something that is going to outweigh the right. severity of this law I'm breaking. Well, you have to know in your own, <laughs> you, have, you have to know in your own head too what your capabilities are. If your capabilities, yeah. you know, we always say like in long distance shooting, if you can't hit the target, you shouldn't be taking a headshot at somebody that's got a hostage. If you can't hit the target, what's what's the penalty of a miss? Uh, or if you're so highly intoxicated that you can't even see right. two feet in front of your you face, five well, then you people probably in front need of you. to just get out of the way and <laughs> yeah. let someone else handle yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that would be that would be a, a more responsible choice, but you know you can't hold, say, for instance, a drunk girl uh, accountable for, say, for instance, someone raping her while she's under the influence, right? You would never say that she was the instigator of that. That's valid. Uh, That's right. You know, so if you're if you're drunk, do you have the right to defend yourself? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now, yeah. does a drunk be, girl being raped have the ability to, ability uh, to you know, defend right. herself with a firearm against a rapist? Well, if it, legally, maybe <laughs> not, depending on the state, because she might not yeah. be allowed to be armed during that time. I know. Isn't that strange? Yeah, yeah, it really is strange. I usually say if you're too drunk to drive, you're too drunk to shoot straight. That's a good litmus test. Well, I mean, you students, know, right? With, Just with, bring a designated yeah. shooter with you. you know, with, <laughs> designated shooter. <laughs> designated. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, hey, whatever it takes, right? You know, hey, so who Whoever the, de the DD is of the group is also the designated marksman. Yeah, my wife and I go to dinner. I'm always shooting and driving. She's there you drinking. Go. Yeah. Shooting always and driving. Drinking. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. I Love mean, it. it's it's important that we as responsible gun owners make good choices. Yeah. So it's yeah, definitely true. recommended. Yeah, if you're going to drink, then you probably Shouldn't should put the gun away. Or if you feel the need to have a gun where you're drinking, maybe you, maybe shouldn't, you shouldn't be, be there. Maybe you, yeah. shouldn't, maybe be you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Right. But the bottom okay. line is law is the law. So right. if right. you are an American and you and you are able to exercise your rights, then you should be able to exercise those rights when you're asleep, when you're awake. Yeah. When you, you see what I'm saying there? I do. Yeah. And I think that people certainly are, um, you know, people own their actions, right? Yeah, true. Uh, so... I think that it's just important to remember that no matter what state of mind you might be in, whether it's an emotional state of mind you're in or whether it is a altered state of mind from some substance, whatever, you're still responsible for your actions. And what you do is what you do. And you're responsible for what you do. It is going to have a consequence if you do something crazy or wrong, right? So 
I think that that tends to be where the paradigm shift becomes with a lot of people when it comes to 2A uh, and getting into, let's just say, the cannabis world or getting into, you know, Title I substances or psychedelics or microdosing or any of that type of thing you might be looking at that is sort of in the gray area for some people. They view themselves as very, very responsible and honest people, and they don't want to be treated like second-class citizens that don't get to deserve, that don't deserve to protect themselves simply because they feel like they can handle themselves and be in their mind correctly and be, you know, functional and honest and forthcoming members right. of society and that they don't feel like that should be enough of a reason for them to, one, not buy a gun or not be able to buy a gun and two, not be able to carry and use a gun if they feel their life is threatened just like anyone else would. When when we looked at, we had uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman on our show and, uh, oh, nice. and we talked to him about how sleep deprivation can kind of be on that same level of using alcohol. And if we put it on, if we put it at that thought process of, okay, if, if you're really exhausted and tired, then you're not gonna be able to make as good decisions. You're probably not gonna be able to shoot as straight. So, you know, if we put that in the same level of alcohol, you know, that, that kind of makes it maybe a little more understanding, right? If you're not up to par to where you normally be up to par, you God forbid you'd end up shooting somebody you didn't intend to shoot or miss the bad guy and actually hit a kid. So we gotta make better choices. We gotta make better choices out there when it comes to that. But should the government be dictating that? No. Right? right. I mean, I think that society to. as a whole should should dictate that through their actions, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they should they should definitely self-regulate yeah. right so it's like you see someone doing some something dumb you say look don't don't yeah. do that crap <laughs> yeah it out. you know yeah. we, we are our own you know best regulators in terms of how we handle society and that and that comes down to uh raising children properly that comes down to good parenting yeah. skills in the household that sure. comes down to you know good values and good morals and and a good sense of right and wrong and so there's many things that go into what make a person who they are and what their views Very are true. on given subjects, you know. So well, the interesting <clears throat> political inconsistency here that you you uh, kind of touched upon at the beginning of this, you know, if someone is caught with an illicit substance, say, such as like a certain amount of marijuana or something mm -hmm. like that, in many cases it is just a slap of the hand. Yeah. But now, if you have a permitted or a law-abiding gun owner or someone like that, then now it affects their right to exercise that right. Yep. Why is that inconsistent? Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually segregating the gun owner yep. and giving them more of a uh, consequence for doing something exact that otherwise they just get a slap in the hand because why is that? That's the question that needs to be answered. Yeah. So why is that inconsistency there? Well, you know, it was talked earlier about uh, you know, pandering potentially to a voting base, you know, that might be one thing, you know, and unfortunately we see a lot of people in government not really wanting us to exercise our rights, especially the Second Amendment, because mm -hmm. ultimately an armed and educated citizenry is the true fourth check and balance in a constitutional republic and our ultimate homeland security. So yeah. why is it that they want to disarm that person Whereas if they weren't armed, they're just going to give you a, a slap on the wrist. Especially when they're using Title I substances as an excuse to right. disarm. That's when it may, when that really shouldn't be as much of a factor as what they weigh on it so heavily as. Yeah. So let's look at the forty four seventy three real quick. All right. So when you fill out a forty four seventy three, okay. Let me pull this up. And sorry, I was texting while we were talking because the dog is raising hell, and hopefully y'all don't hear that. But I'm sorry. <laughs> I live with dogs, y'all, okay? They, so they, they want to get in on the gripes, too, so I apologize they if do. you hear the puppies. All right, so here's 4473. We're going to go over one of the questions on 4473. Uh, and if you don't know, 4473 is a form you fill out when you purchase a firearms over-the-counter transaction record. All right. Uh, let's see. Are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any depressant, stimulant, narcotic drug, or any controlled, any other controlled substance. Uh, warning, the use or possession of marijuana remains unlawful under federal law regardless of whether it has been legalized or decriminalized for medical or recreational purposes in the state where you reside. So this warning mm -hmm. was not always on a 4473. Recent. And if you look at the wording of this question, it's a little ambiguous. Okay, so are you an unlawful user of a user of well, did you? Are we talking when? You, did you use it when you were sixteen behind the the the, the gym? Does it count if you didn't inhale? Yeah. Does Ooh. it count if you didn't inhale? That's valid. I mean, or addicted to? All right. Well, are you addicted to it? I'm not. No. Okay. So here's the thing: stimulant, any 
uh, mar marijuana or any depressant stimulant. Mm -hmm. So what, did you drink a cup of coffee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coffee's a stim caffeine's a stimulant. Yep. Nicotine's a stimulant. Mm -hmm. So there are so many Vague. vaguely worded yeah. but conjecture that's in there that, you know what I mean? Law like, where do you draw the line? And, and laws are made that way so that they can they can get you. I mean, being law enforcement, I see it all the time. It's where they, interpretive. They, right. It's interpretive so they can say, well, you know, we really want to get this person because this is so vaguely worded. Uh, we, can, we can craft this so we can convince a jury that this person was in, in breach of this law. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that's really what's so crazy it about is. it. Yeah, it's scary. It's scary. Every, you know, the power so what, what was it? The, the head of the KGB, or what, what it was, it was before the KGB. It was, it was Stalin's, like, secret police or whatever back in the war or whatever. And he said, you show me the man and I'll find you the law. Or I'll show me the man and I'll show you the law. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's sure. like, they're going to find a way. Yeah. Yeah. If they got their man and they yeah. want their man bad enough, they're going to find a way to pin him. And how does that go back to you think about like, now you got to watch your back. You got always have to be looking for the, the boogeyman, the, the government coming for you. And you got you to gotta be right. If you, don't, if you do something wrong that we don't like as a government, we'll get you. We'll get you some way or another. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. That's I believe not that's freedom. the danger. That's not it, freedom. It's not freedom. That's not freedom at all. And, you know, so where as a society do we say enough is enough? Draw that line. You know, and, and it's it's a scary environment. Yeah. You know, and, and to be fair, this is not a political discussion. Mm. Okay, my rights are not political. Your ability to do what you want or put what you want in your body is mm. not my right to tell you what to do or what not to do with your body. And it's not the, mm. it's not the government's right to, to tell you what you can and can't put in your body. It's not necessarily a pro-drug or pro-cannabis position. It's not an anti- or pro-gun position. It's simply, you know, recognizing that these laws are put into place for them to weaponize the system mm -hmm. against you yeah. when needed. Yeah. When needed. So yeah. when we Their talk convenience. about the selective enforcement aspect of what this gripe is even about, we have to remember that selective means that it's just like Stalin's secret police. They're going to find the man first. Then they're going to find whatever in the hundreds of thousands of random statutes and laws and anything they can. They're going to dig deep enough and they'll find something. So I think that's the danger. Yeah. Yeah, just... And that's the ultimate power of the government until we as a people recognize that the Constitution is negative governance, meaning it restricts what the government yeah. does. It doesn't give us any right. We have those rights, but yep. that Constitution restricts what the government does. Until we recognize that and remember that, people won't hold as much value and they believe right. that the government gives them rights. And if the government gives, the government can take it away. You, know, the, you okay. saying that makes me think of a lobster in a pot. I'm hungry, I guess, I don't know. But you know, a lobster in a pot and you just slowly turn up the heat. Right. I mean, that's kind of how we're at. We're at that way right now in the United States where, you know, these laws and we keep, that line keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed and that heat keeps turning up and up and up. And eventually yeah. we're dead. There's no more line. The line's gone. The goalpost, you know what I mean? And, and they've won. They've got us in full suppression. They do whatever they want. We have to toe the line. We have to do exactly what they say. We have no way to, to defend ourselves or stop them or you know, et cetera. Well, we do have ways to stop them, but we have to get together, get on page, yeah. and actually stand up and stand up for your rights and your rights. And, and unfortunately, a lot of us kind of just worry about our own lives, lives. Yeah. and our own thing, whatever that, that is. That's the most and important. We have to remember that it's not gun rights. It's not, you know, it's, it's all about the individual rights and liberties of all mm -hmm. Americans. And uh, until we respect everyone's rights, no matter which one it is, then we're going to have these conversations yeah. moving forward. I agree. I think that we really need to be careful about the dangers mm -hmm. of trying to legislate morality. Mm. You know, and, that, and that's what all of this comes down to is you can't legislate morality. And, you know, we have a very defined set of rules that the government must play by. The, 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 the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, we look at all of our founding documents, and though those documents, you know, they clarify the jewels that the government is not to touch. They can walk around it. They can go, wow, that's pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, they can feel the warmth of it. They can, you know, take pictures of it, you know, whatever they need to do, but they can't touch it. It's like Indiana Jones and the idol, you know, and the bag of sand, like, Stay away, <laughs> or a giant boulder is going to fall. There's yeah. pits. I mean, it, there's yeah. pitfalls, right? So, when we look at this situation, I think that it's just I want people to come away from this video and just understand that, okay, you may not necessarily be, you know, pro 
uh, you know, two A or whatever. Okay, that's fine. You may not be pro uh, cannabis. cannabis or pro recreation or medical mm -hmm. drug use of, or you may not be uh, for the, uh, you know, the the deregulation of certain title or Schedule One substances. Was what I'm trying to say. But it's fair to say that let's say that maybe you dip your toes in one of those little pools in one little area, right? I think it's safe to say you wouldn't want the other people saying, get out of my pool. Hmm. And there's room for everybody, right? So, you know, it's important to show solidarity for liberty and rights and people's ability to do what they want and let that be sort of the jewel that we stay away from. And we can all, you know, decide to undertake what parts of liberty we want. Like, if you don't want to be a gun owner, don't buy a gun. That's okay. You don't have to be a gun owner. No, no, no one's forcing on you, just yeah. like no one's forcing you to, you know, light up a, a joint or whatever. True. So it's the thing. It's like personal choice should be right. the underlying fundamentals, right? Because personal choice is what's going to cause you to do or not do whatever you're going to do in the end anyway. Yeah. So why should choice not be part of the equation when choice is what is going to make the de determination whether you commit a crime or not anyway. Well, even if you don't exercise a right, you need to recognize that it still is your right. Mm. And this last year has taught me as an educator, and Matt as well, you mm. know, we, we train lots and lots of people to exercise their Second Amendment rights. We had plenty of people last year who say two years ago did not value the Second Amendment at all. Yep. Some of them were even anti-gun. Yeah, and now they realize, oh, this is for me. So if we can value all of our rights, no matter what they are, you never know what's down the road. Maybe you'll want to use it someday. Yep. I agree. Makes and sense. I think that there's, there's certainly a danger in this whole thing. So I think we covered the bases pretty well. Yeah. Any other good. thoughts, Matt? No, just, uh, you know, get involved and don't you know, just leave us alone, government, I guess. <laughs> That's what we really yeah. want, right? Just be left alone by the government, do our thing. You know, yeah. be nice to everybody until it's no longer time to what be nice. What an idea, right? Mm -hmm. What an idea, the Revelation. fact that, you know, you just want to be left <laughs> alone and live your life the way you that's want. It. And I don't think that's an unfair thing no. for someone to just want to live the way they want. And I'm totally all about it because that's yeah. the way I live. Like, I want to live the way I want, yep. and I want to do right by people, and I want to be fair, and I want to try to look at things from every perspective, and I want to constantly evolve and learn, right? Like, I want my perspective to be challenged because... I don't want to have a defined and closed-minded view of the reality I see before me. I want to accept all the possibilities and use, hopefully, what is a sharp wit and some logic thrown in there to go, all right, I see your point, I see your point, I see your point. This is me. I'm here. This is the way I feel about it. And, uh, hey, you do you, you do you, you over there, you do you, yeah. and I'm going to do me. And, hey, we're cool. You're not trying to hurt nobody. Y'all aren't trying to hurt each other. That's the way it should be. Yeah, totally. But they just can't help themselves. No. Nah. The system as it stands now is certainly a weaponized, it is, is a weaponized component. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that, that they want everyone. <laughs> they want to get everybody, not just a select few. But the way the laws are set up, mm -hmm. as we mentioned, is they can select who they want yep. at any time any and time. use any combination of little, you yep. know, Tricks things to and... go. All right. Well, there's our man. We got our man. Now let's find the crime. And that's, that's just let's, let's, that's just scare is. everybody. That's just scare everybody in that mindset. You know, I mean, no matter who you are, you know, we why do we want the government coming in and, and affecting our lives just because they want to? They, you know, they you said something or you know they don't like how you're living. Just leave me alone. I agree. <laughs> so, uh, where can our viewers, uh, you know, find you guys? Meet the pressers. Yeah. Meetthepressers.com. It's uh, meet the pressers on all the social media. So make sure you subscribe to their channel, Meet Pressers, great guys. Uh, make sure you follow them on social media platforms and everything like that. Uh, big thank you to all the folks that watched today's video. We hope that maybe we uh, you know, garnered a little bit of thought in your mind and opened up your mind to maybe some fresh perspective. I think it's very important. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's video. Thanks for watching yet again. Uh, if you wish to support us directly, there's a lot of ways you can do so. Go over to Ballistic Inc., pick yourself up a snazzy t-shirt. We've got some good ones. Okay, uh, you can go over to Patreon and you can support Meet the Pressers or us, uh, depending on, you know, if you'd like to support both, that's cool. Those are some of the ways you can support us. Also, uh, we've got some great man cans for sale over on the website, great subscription boxes, and some just uh, direct merch boxes we put together with tons of useful gear. Check them out. Uh, those are the ways that you can directly support us. Have a great day. Many more gun gripes on the way. Uh, we hope that we'll have... Uh, Matt and Clint visiting us again. Uh, they were passing through to do some classes here in Georgia. So uh, we definitely 
like to take the opportunity to do videos together when we can. So it's always great to get some fresh perspective. Have a great day. And guys, thanks for joining us. Thank thanks you for having us. Have a good one.